The Wretched of the Earth by France Fanon, translated from the French by Richard Pilcox, narrated by Moare Jagusa. Chapter 1 On Violence National Liberation, National Reawakening, Restoration of the Nation to the People or Commonwealth, whatever the name used, whatever the latest expression, decolonization is always a violent event. At whatever level we study it, individual encounters, a change of name for a sports club, the guest list at a cocktail party, members of a police force or the board of directors of a state or private bank, Decolonization is quite simply the substitution of one species of mankind by another. The substitution is unconditional, absolute, total, and seamless. We could go on to portray the rise of a new nation, the establishment of a new state, its diplomatic relations and its economic and political orientation, but instead we have decided to describe the kind of tabula rasa which, from the outset, defines any decolonization. What is sim singularly important is that it starts from the very first day with the basic claims of the colonized. In actual fact, proof of success lies in a societal fabric that has been changed inside out. This change is extraordinarily important because it is desired, clamored for, and demanded. The need for this change exists in a raw, repressed, and reckless state in the lives and consciousness of colonized men and women. But the eventuality of such a change is also experienced as a terrifying future in the consciousness of another species of men and women, the colon. The colonists. Decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the word world, is clearly an agenda for total disorder, but it cannot be accomplished by the wave of a magic wand, a natural cataclysm, or a gentleman's agreement. Decolonization, we know, is an historical process. In other words, it can only be understood it can only find its significance and become self-coherent insofar as we can discern the history-making movement which gives it form and substance. Decolonization is the encounter between two congenitally antagonistic forces that in fact owe their singularity to the kind of reification secreted and nurtured by the colonial situation. Their first confrontation was colored by violence and their cohabitation, or rather the exploitation of the colonized by the colonizer, continued at the point of the bayonet and under cannon fire. The colonist and the colonized are old acquaintances, and consequently, the colonist is right when he says he knows them. It is the colonist who fabricated and continues to fabricate the colonized subject. The colonist derives his validity i.e. his wealth, from the colonial system. Decolonization never goes unnoticed, for it focuses on and fundamentally alters being and transforms the spectator crushed into a non-essential state into a privileged actor, captured in a virtually grandiose fashion by the spotlight of history. It infuses a new rhythm specific to a new generation of men with a new language and a new humanity. Decolonization is truly the creation of new men, but such a creation cannot be attributed to a supernatural power. The thing colonized becomes a man through the very process of liberation. Decolonization therefore implies the urgent need to thoroughly challenge the colonial situation. Its definition can, if we want to describe it accurately, be summed up in the well-known words, the last shall be first. Decolonization is verification of this. At a descriptive level, therefore, any decolonization is a success. In its bare reality, decolonization reeks of red-hot cannonballs and bloody knives. 
for the last can be first only after a murderous and decisive confrontation between the two protagonists. This determination to have the last move up to the front, to have them clamber up, too quickly, say some, the famous echelons of an organized society, can only succeed by resorting to every means, including, of course, violence. You do not disorganize a society, however primitive it may be, with such an agenda, if you are not determined from the very smart to start to smash every obstacle encountered. The colonized, who have made up their mind to make such an agenda into a driving force, have been prepared for violence from time immemorial. As soon as they were born, it was obvious to them that their cramped world, riddled with taboos, can only be challenged by out-and-out out violence. The colonial world is a compartmentalized world. It is obviously a superfluous to recall the existence of native towns and European schools, towns of schools for natives and schools for Europeans, as it can, is to recall apartheid in South Africa. Yet, if we penetrate inside this compartmentalization, we shall at least bring to light some, if, uh, some of its key aspects. By penetrating its geographical configuration and classification, we shall be able to delineate the backbone on which the decolonized society is reorganized. The colonized world is a world divided in two. The dividing line, the border, is represented by the barracks and the police stations. In the colonies, the official legitimate agent, the spokesperson for the colonizer and the regime of oppression, is the police officer or the soldier. In capitalist societies, education, whether secular or religious, the teaching of moral reflexes handed down from father to son, the exemplary integrity of workers decorated after 50 years of loyal and faithful service, the fostering of love for harmony and wisdom, the, those aesthetic forms of respect for the status quo, instill in the exploited a mood of submission and inhibition which considerably eases the task of the agents of law and order. In capitalist countries, a multitude of sermonizers, counselors, and confusion mongerers intervene between the exploited and the authorities. In colonial regions, however, the proximity and frequent direct intervention by the police and the military ensure the colonized are kept under close scrutiny and contained by rifle butts and napalm. We have seen how the government's agent uses a language of pure violence. The agent does not alleviate oppression or mask domination. He displays and demonstrates them with the clear conscience of the law enforcer and brings violence into the homes and minds of the colonized subject. The native sector is not complementary to the European sector. The two confront each other, but not in the service of a higher unity. Governed by a purely Aristotelian logic, they follow the dictates of mutual exclusion. There is no conciliation possible. One of them is superfluous. The colonist sector is a sector built to last, all stone and steel. It is a sector of lights and paved roads, where the trash cans constantly overflow with strange and wonderful garbage, undreamed of leftovers. The colonists' feet can never be glimpsed, except perhaps in the sea, but you can never get close enough. They are protected by solid shoes in a sector where the streets are clean and smooth, without a pothole, without a stone. The colonist sector is sated, sluggish, it is, its belly is permanently full of good things. The colonist sector is a white folk sector, a sector of foreigners. The colonized sector, or at least the native quarters, the shanty town, the medina, the reservation, is a disreputable place inhabited by disreputable people. You are born anywhere, anyhow. You die anywhere from anything. It is a world with no space. People are piled on top of one another. The shacks squeeze tightly together. 
The colonized sector is a famished sector, hungry for bread, meat, shoes, coal, and light. The colonized sector is a sector that crouches and cowers, a sector on its knees, a sector that is prostrate. It is a sector of niggers, a sector of towel heads. The gaze that the colonized subject casts at the colonist sector is a look of lust, a look of envy. Dreams of possession, every type of possession, of sitting at the colonist's table and sleeping in his bed, preferably with his wife. The colonized man is an envious man. The colonist is aware of this as he catches the furtive glance and constantly on his guard realizes bitterly that they want to take our place. And it's true, there is not one colonized subject who at least once a day does not dream of taking the place of the colonist. This compartmentalized world, this world divided into two, is inhabited by different species. The singularity of the colonial context and the fact that economic reality, inequality, and enormous disparities in lifestyles never managed to mask the human reality. Looking at the immediacies of the colonial context, it is clear that when what divides this world is first and foremost what species, what race one belongs to. In the colonies, the economic infrastructure is also a superstructure. The cause is effect. You are rich because you are white. You are white because you are rich. This is why a Marxist analyst should always be slightly stretched when it comes to addressing the colonial issue. It is not just the concept of the pre-capitalist society, so effectively studied by Marx, which needs to be re-examined here. The serf is essentially different from the knight, but a reference to divine right is needed to justify this difference in statues. In the colonies, the foreigner imposed himself using his cannons and machines. Despite the success of his pacification, in spite of his appropriation, the colonist always remains a foreigner. It is not the factories, the estates, or the bank accounts which primarily characterize the ruling class. The ruling species is first and foremost the outsider from elsewhere, different from the indigenous population the others. The violence which governed the ordering of the colonial world, which tirelessly punctuated the destruction of the indigenous social fabric and demolished unchecked the systems of reference of the country's economy, lifestyles, and modes of dress, the same violence will be vindicated and appropriated when taking history into their own hands the colonial swarm into the forbidden cities. The colonized swarm into the forbidden cities. To blow the colonial world to smithereens is henceforth a clear image within the grasp and imagination of every colonized subject. To dislocate the colonial world does not mean that once the borders have been eliminated, there will be a right of way between the two sectors. To destroy the colonial world means nothing less than demolishing the colonists' sector, burying it deep within the earth, or banishing it from the territory.